I've been here for four years. I'm coming up on my fourth year anniversary. I'm not quite there yet. And as I reflect back, and I don't mean this to be flippant, but COVID was such a gift for me. And I say that because I started at TFI a few weeks before COVID happened and did not have an opportunity to get to meet my staff or to go meet the membership or, or anything. So from about March until August, I was doing a lot of phone calls. But once the fall got here, I just said, look, I can't wait for this pandemic to end. And as you think about agriculture, farmers are still in the field. All of my members never left their places of work. They were all still in their offices. And so I had no meetings. There were no conferences going on. Capitol Hill wasn't allowing visitors. So I said, heck, I'm gonna take advantage of this. And I hit the road hard starting in September of 2020. In that first year, from September 2020 through 2021, I made 50 member visits. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Corey Rosenbush, President and CEO of the Fertilizer Institute, or TFI. Corey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joanna. Really appreciate you having me on. Hey, tell us about TFI. We're the trade association that represents the fertilizer industry. Primarily, we advocate on policy-related issues that help our members grow their business. Our membership will encompass the entire supply chain of the fertilizer industry. So we'll have manufacturers of fertilizer, and, and that can be multiple nutrients, we call them. So nitrogen, phosphate, and potash, as well as sulfur, mi micronutrients, biologicals, et cetera. Then we have all of the distributors and wholesalers of that product. We have importers, and then we have the ag retailers that are the ones selling and applying it for uh, the farmers. So, Corey, I'm thinking of miracle Grow, which I have a really big container of, right, because I'm watering the plants out front and I'm watering the plants at my house. Do your members serve the residential industry, the commercial industry, industrials, or all of the above? All of the above, as well as non-fertilizer use. Oh. You would be surprised how many fertilizer products get used for runway de-icing, for example. Most of the major airports would work with our companies to buy their de-icing fluids and equipment. If you have a diesel-powered vehicle or a diesel truck driver, you use a product called DEF, diesel exhaust fluid, and uh, that helps with emission abatement. So that is a fertilizer-generated product. It all goes back to anhydrous ammonia, which is the building block for all of those products. Amazing. With that said, 80% of those products are used for agricultural farming purposes. Now, Corey, the website says fertilizer improves lives. I love that. It's a great assertion. So give us your elevator pitch. How does fertilizer improve lives? There was a study that some scientists did a couple of decades ago where they wanted to quantify what the impact was on food security and crop yields. And what we found was that about 50% of all the crop yields on this planet can be attributed to fertilizer use. Ah. And they estimated that three out of every five lives on this planet are here because of fertilizer. And so if we didn't have fertilizer to achieve the crop yields that we have today, half of the people on the planet wouldn't be here because there'd be no food to eat. 
There'd be mass famine. Mass famine. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, when we went through these market challenges that we had the last two years, there is still a concern of what that's going to do on continents like Africa, where fertilizer wasn't necessarily available or they couldn't afford it. And farmers that are growing the food that they eat potentially have a bigger impact than maybe what we understand here in the United States. Well, Corey, we're going to talk about the things that TFI is doing to thrive, and thriving you are. But before we do that, let's talk about your journey. So how did you get to become president and CEO of TFI? Great question. And and I'm going to go in the way, way back machine. I grew up in a small rural town in Texas, southwest of Fort Worth. There were 2,000 people in my town. There was only one town in my county in a state where everything's big. My county was the second smallest county in the state. And my dad was an agricultural science teacher at the high school. Ah. So I grew up, you know, raising livestock. We lived way out in the country. Agricultural were my roots. I went to Texas A&M and studied agricultural development. And my first career was doing international development work. So if you think about the U.S. Agency for International Development that would provide funds for developing countries That was my career path. I did a master's degree at Harvard in international development, and then I ended up living for three years in Indonesia. And we worked primarily out in the Eastern Islands, and we were helping farmers that didn't have market access because they didn't have a population to sell to. So a lot of the crops were just rotting on the side of the road, develop those markets, export some of those higher value crops, did that work all over the world really for a few years. Came back to D.C. because my wife said she had had enough of Indonesia. She was ready to do her career stuff and start a family. And when I arrived here, just randomly had a lunch on Capitol Hill one day. And the gentleman that was at the lunch was looking for someone. And uh, I ended up taking a job, my first association job at the uh, Global Cold Chain Alliance. Oh, I was uh, number two there for seven years supporting the president and CEO. His name is Bill Hudson. And he was kind of my mentor and taught me about this business. And then when he retired, I was an internal candidate, which is a whole nother topic you could do a podcast on. Right. And ended up becoming the president and CEO. Spent seven years there as the CEO. So 15 years in total. A recruiter reached out to me, asked me about the Fertilizer Institute. It was a great opportunity to go back to my roots. So Remember me telling you about my agricultural background? This brought me home. I'm working with people that I knew from my childhood now, and it's a lot of fun, and it's great to reestablish so many of those relationships. Boy, that's really amazing. So you've got the subject matter expertise as well as the executive experience to run an organization like TFI. They couldn't have found a better candidate. I wouldn't say I have the subject matter expertise, but I at least live in that world. One of the hard parts about coming to TFI for me was that I grew up in the livestock industry. So I understand animal agriculture really well. And TFI mainly is dealing with row crops and corn is king, soybeans, all the crops, the row crops that require fertilizer is just a completely different area of agriculture that I was not familiar with. So I still had to learn it. So how do you learn that? How do you as an exec know enough to run the organization and lead them and interact with the members? I love this question because I've been here for four years. I'm coming up on my fourth year anniversary. I'm not quite there yet. And as I reflect back, and I don't mean this to be flippant, but COVID was such a gift for me. And I say that because I started at TFI a few weeks before COVID happened and did not have an opportunity to get to meet my staff or to go meet the membership or or anything. So from about March until August, I was doing a lot of phone calls. Matter of fact, I think I lost 25 pounds because I was working from home. I had three kids that all needed to do online school. My wife was, they wouldn't let me stay in the house. So they kicked me out and I just walked around town from nine to five on the phone all day long. <laughs> oh, because you were on the phone all day long and making a lot of noise. I was putting in 25,000 steps a day. It was great. But once the fall got here, I just said, look, I can't wait for this pandemic to end. And as you think about agriculture, farmers are still in the field. Right. All of my members never left. 
their places of work. They were all still in their offices. And so I had no meetings. There were no conferences going on. Capitol Hill wasn't allowing visitors. So I said, heck, I'm going to take advantage of this. And I hit the road hard starting in September of 2020. In that first year, from September 2020 through 2021, I made 50 member visits. <gasps> were you flying, driving, both? All flying, all flying. For like $100 a flight, right? I mean, I remember going to California for $100. Nobody was on the airplane. It was great. Yes. You were studying by yourself. It was fantastic. But they were all at work, and they loved the fact that a visitor was coming. Uh-huh. And they hadn't had visitors, and so they welcomed me, and they got so much time that in a normal world, I would have never been able to do that. I would have never had the time. I would have been so busy, booked back-to-back with meetings and schedules and Hill meetings. And frankly, they probably wouldn't have had such an open schedule to receive me. So in some ways, there was no better way to start a job than to be out in the field, visiting those businesses and spending quality time learning what they do, but building those relationships because decisions and direction are a lot easier when you've had that established from your members. And what a connection you've made with the members because you went out to see them, spent time with them, and now they feel like you're totally in their camp. You have a trust factor that just doesn't exist in a normal CEO transition. I mean, it really was a gift. I was so lucky and fortunate. So COVID really gave you the time and space to connect with your members in a way that probably you don't have today because of all of your commitments. A hundred percent. I would have never been able to do that today. Wow. Well, let's turn to TFI. You just published your industry trends research where you say you all talk about the up at night issues for your members. So tell us about that. What's happening with the industry? We partnered with uh, Potomac Core. They do a really nice job at the outside in. So rather than thinking about an association strategic plan that focuses around growing membership or growing a trade show or how to position your publication. It's really about understanding what your members are doing and what are their key issues and keeping them up at night. And then you can shape your strategic plan. And so for us, some of those key issues were, first of all, the fertilizer markets. We had had the most volatile fertilizer markets the last two years that we'd seen since 2008. Because of COVID or because of the wars? It was a black swan event. And, you know, there were probably five or six different things. You had COVID issues. You had supply chain issues. You had some weather events. So you had the hurricane that came up and hit Louisiana and knocked out some plants and knocked out natural gas. You had the Texas freeze. Oh, right. That shut down a lot of the natural. Natural gas is our feedstock to making fertilizer. And so that had a big impact. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. And so there were all sorts of issues that disrupted the markets. And then that turned to another big issue, which was geopolitics. And then we have, of course, the number one probably up at night issue is just policy and policy that impacts their business. And we we talk a lot about what came across really strong in that research was regulatory certainty and the ability to make massive capital investments. A nitrogen plant, for example. You're talking about $3 billion to build one. So the capital that these companies are deploying is so massive, they need to have some certainty around the investments they're making. Those are some of the key things. And then I'd I'd just say last, a key theme that went through all of it, of course, was sustainability. Agriculture, of course, and the food systems are under the microscope when it comes to sustainability. Because we use natural gas and the byproduct of CO2, we are an emitter of CO2. And so we have to think about not only manufacturing a fertilizer, but then fertilizer use. And so you have fertilizer that will run off into our water system that will be released into the air. There's leaching that occurs. So we have an opportunity to tackle some of the the environmental issues really from both sides, both use as well as production. And while that did not rank as high recently because of the market situations in our research. It was number one or two a couple of years ago when we did it. And and it continues to be an issue. And so the theme that stretched across all those issues was really storytelling Mm. and really prioritizing our big initiative was getting out there and telling the story of the industry and making sure the general public understands 
the importance of it and some of the challenges as well. Man, you just gave me a huge mouthful. So let's unpack this a little bit. Okay, yes. Black Swan event, all kinds of things happening, weather, freeze, geopolitical. How do you support your members during such a tumultuous time? Yeah, and and I'll tell you what was the biggest challenge is that farmers were angry. And so there is a constituency in this country that you do not want upset at you. That's the farmer. Ah. And, you know, for some of the fertilizer products, we were seeing increases of 300%. You know, a lot of questions that farmers were asking, why are prices going up this much? We saw crop prices going up at the same time. And so are you just increasing your prices because our market's increasing too? And that was not the case. It is a globally traded product that is subject to global supply and demand trends. And so we had to really get out there on the front line and communicate about this. TV, radio, Capitol Hill, we were covering it all. How were you communicating with farmers? I was doing a lot of farm meetings. Ah, okay. Farmer co-ops, you know, would have their regular meetings and I would go and speak to the farm co-op groups You have all of the farm commodity groups, so corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, rice. They all have their annual meetings or regular meetings or policy meetings. And so I was really spending a lot of time at some of those commodity association meetings. And our economist, we have an economist on staff, full-time economist, and he was doing the same. I think at one point we stopped counting. We had hit over 160 different meetings to get the message out and to explain what was going on with the marketplace. Boy, that's really astonishing. So normally you think of a trade association as really focused on its members and maybe kind of representing the industry to Capitol Hill. But what you were doing was reaching out directly to their customers and communicating what was happening. What a gift for the membership. Well, and you know, it's because I love going to Capitol Hill and I love asking a member of Congress how are things going in your district? What are you hearing from your constituents? And it, it used to be you hear the same old thing. They would complain about taxes or health care. Well, that answer <laughs> in some of these rural districts that we were engaging with became the price of fertilizer. Ah. That was their number one complaint they were getting from their constituents. So we became front and center. And it was Hill related too. Uh, the first hearing for the House Ag Committee this year in January focused uh, on input costs. And so I I got to experience my four-hour marathon of testifying in front of the committee about the issue because, Ooh. frankly, the farmers were, were complaining about it. That was their top issue. Well, let's turn to something else that you mentioned, which I don't know that I've ever encountered in this podcast. And you said there was a geopolitical impact on the industry. Tell us about that. I remember having dinner with some friends pretty early on in my time here at TFI, and they asked me how the new job was going. I said, it was going great, but this week has been a bit of a problem with Lukashenko's hijacking of that aircraft. And they looked at me and they were like, we thought you went to the Fertilizer Institute. Right. What does that have to do with that? So Belarus hijacked that airplane. Right. And the response from the global community was to lay heavy sanctions on the Belarusian government. Did you know that Belarus's number one source of tax revenue comes from their fertilizer industry? It's largely as well state-owned. And so that product quickly got sanctioned. Lithuania, which is the port that Belarus uses to export, blocked all exports. They wouldn't allow them to use it anymore. You're talking about 20% of the global potash supply coming from Belarus. Now, let's fast forward to February. I was in Zug, Switzerland. Zug is known as the mineral kind of trading capital of the world. I have multiple Russian fertilizer companies owned by the oligarchs that are based there. And I was there visiting for other reasons. And I walked into my first visit that morning, and it was like showing up at a funeral because that was the morning that Russia invaded Ukraine. Ah. And all of the employees knew that their livelihoods were about to come to an end because the impact was going to be serious. And of course it was. Europe, UK, 
Canada, Australia, most of the developing world quickly sanctioned those oligarchs. And then, of course, that Friday, three of those that are members of TFI were sitting in the Kremlin with Putin that morning when Putin started to explain to the oligarchs what he was doing. Wow. So the optics were horrific. I can't get into all of the details of what happened next, but we quickly had to figure out how we were going to respond and what was going to happen. Keep in mind, we were already in a bit of a fertilizer market crisis. And so now you take the world's largest supplier of fertilizer, Russia, combine that with Belarus, you're talking about 40% of global potash supply (gasps) being removed from the market. They also have about a third of nitrogen as well as phosphate products. And we were about to just add insult to injury. And those angry farmers that we're talking about were about to get even more angry. It was a challenging time, but at the same time, it gave us an opportunity to really use that crisis to educate folks on the importance of fertilizer and the impact, again, on food security. Food security is national security. I think a lot of lawmakers did not realize that 90% of fertilizer is consumed outside the United States. So we don't necessarily set some of those markets, and we are a net importer. As an example, 93% of our potash is imported. We have very little potash. Phosphate and potash are both mined minerals, and they are where God put them on this earth. Right. And unfortunately, it's not a lot in the U.S. We're lucky that 85% of that potash comes from Canada, a friendly country. But because it's a globally traded commodity, even though we're getting it from Canada, prices still has an impact. Right, right. So we slapped sanctions against Russia. We actually did not. We didn't? We were the only major developing country that decided rather than sanctioning those fertilizer companies, we were going to exempt fertilizer from sanctions. Ah. We sanctioned everything else (laughs) about them except fertilizer. And it's like I said, it was at a time when we were already under such pressure and doing so could have potentially caused widespread famine. Boy, that's really nuanced policy making to exempt a specific commodity because it affects the global supply chain and global agriculture. Yeah, and the ability to eat. And I bet you had something to do with that. TFI did. That was a tricky little tightrope. So, you know, officially we did not take a position on what to do, but we definitely spent a lot of time at the White House educating them on global fertilizer markets. Amazing. Let's turn to something different. Thank you for that storytelling. Corey, you said when we were doing prep that your members have been urging you to consolidate the industry a little bit. So TFI has been acting like a for-profit and merging with other organizations. That's not common, I think, in the association and nonprofit space. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, if I could go back to the second question you asked around you know, your journey, What I did at GCCA, well, I really should give Bill Hudson credit for it, but what we did together was find a way to, in a shrinking, consolidating industry, industries as a whole are consolidating. We found a way to pull together like-minded industry groups and associations, sometimes that are are just too small to thrive, and pull them together under a single management umbrella while maintaining independence and identity. So, you know, Global Cold Chain Alliance was that umbrella organization where you had four organizations, associations under it. And so when I was interviewing for this job, that was one of the things that they really latched on to because, like I said, all industries are dealing with the fact that their companies are consolidating, but they're still writing dozens of dues checks to all of these different organizations that they just have historically. And It wasn't so much the dues checks, it's the resources of people to participate in all of those and the time required and the travel required. And so one of the things that they prioritized as a board for me to look at when I started was what are the opportunities to bring together some of these associations that are within kind of our ecosystem? Let me make sure I understand this. So your members were saying There are a number of associations that we are members of. There's probably overlapping goals. And we have to have staff basically representing the companies at all these different conferences and committees, et cetera, do something about it. Correct. You got it. Okay. (laughs) That is exactly what I was hearing. 
I had one company that was writing to what we have now, five different dues checks of what we were able to pull together. So we were able to go from five dues checks down to one for them, just as an example. So in the last four years, we've been able to consolidate four associations, acquire four associations. I use the word acquire because that's a private sector term, but it's nuanced for us. Right. The first one really fell in, under the kind of foundation. So we had a foundation called Nutrients for Life. There was the Foundation for Agronomic Research and the Fluid Fertilizer Foundation. And so last year, we took all three of those foundations. We actually officially are merging them into one called the Fertilizer Education Research and Training Foundation, FERT or FERT Foundation for short. That was one group. The other ones was the Micronutrient Manufacturers Association. So in addition to the, the NPK, the big nutrients, we had the micronutrients. So they were independent. They've now merged into TFI. And then the fourth one was the uh, Biostimulant Association. So as we think about the future of crops and use of biologicals to be more efficient with our fertilizers, this was a growing and expanding area. So they came under TFI umbrella and relationship uh, a couple of years ago as well. So pulling all of those groups together is really beneficial for our membership, but also for the industry that can speak with one voice. Corey, in the private sector, you hear about these mergers or these acquisitions, and they talk about how you have to make sense of the products and services. What do you do with the staff? What do you do with the real estate? What do you do with with the overlapping memberships and the benefits. So how do you navigate that? Because the same issues apply even if you're a not-for-profit. Yeah, so let me talk about some failures that I had in my previous life. Because I'd say my batting percentage was about 500. <laughs> not all of them worked. And when we were at GCCA, we were not only trying to look at associations here in the U.S., but we were trying to build a global association as well. So you know, we tried to pull in and merge with Brazil, Europe, and Australia, and South Africa. Only two of those four worked. Mm. The other two did not. They ended up falling through the cracks at the 11th hour. But there was another interesting one, too, and I don't mean this to come across as a brag, but so much of it is the trust in the people and the staff. And so right before I left, we had come to an agreement that the Packaged Ice Association was going to join the Global Cold Chain Alliance. And for them, who only had one staff person, to now suddenly have 20 staff working on their issues was really appealing, while at the same time knowing that those staff become their staff and that they still get to maintain their own independence and their own identity. That is so key in these political decisions. The capital of acquiring associations it's not money, it's politics, identity, and independence. Yes. And that's what you've got to think about when you're doing those acquisitions. And so, unfortunately, I left. And again, this had nothing to do with me, but it really caused that packaged ice group to go, well, wait a minute. We spent a whole year building trust with that staff. Are the staff going to leave? Anyways, they ended up pulling out of it. So it is very people-oriented. And, you know, it is about the fact that when those groups come in, you become their staff too, and they have to like the team. They have to like the people that are going to work for them. So rarely is it that you're going to be eliminating staff. Mm, okay. In some ways, you're going to be able to focus and specialize and have those people work on those issues. But the biostimulant program, for example, I mean, that, how do you help them maintain their identity, but still bring them under the TFI umbrella? That one was done through a council. So we created a council. So they kind of operate like they are an association without all of the legal and governance requirements, which for most industry, that's fantastic because they don't want to it's in budgets and all that governance stuff anyway. Those that do it for that reason and like it, they probably should quit their jobs and go work for an association. <laughs> ah. But most of the time, they they don't want to be the association managers. And when you look at really smaller associations, that's what the industry are, is doing. They're managing the association. And so when you say, look, we're going to take that off your plate, you focus on the issues. You focus on what the industry needs, whether that's standards or policy or networking, leave the rest to us. Boy, that's brilliant. 
because you're essentially saying you're going to have staff to really manage some of the logistics. You can continue to work on the issues, but you are now operating in a bigger environment and presumably have more resources. That's correct. So if you can get past the egos of some board members losing their board seats, how do you do that? Yeah, and I I think it's less about losing their board seats. It's more about losing their voice. And so you have to do it in a way where they still feel like they're being heard, that their voice is projected, and that that identity still exists. So it goes back to the trust again. If they feel like within the new organization, we still have a voice because we trust the leadership, then this can move forward. The minute we tell the biostimulant organization, for example, oh, we can't do that because the other side of TFI doesn't like it, it's over. Mm. It's dead. Corey, you did four acquisitions in three years during a pandemic. How are you managing the staff through all this? Because your staff is increasing as well, and you started before the pandemic and didn't have as much face time with your staff. So how are you managing all this? took me a year to meet them, first of all, which is really unusual. The first question I asked in my one-on-one interviews that I did with every single staff person here, we were about 30 at that point, was tell me about the culture. And every organization has a culture. It's just a matter of whether it's defined and intentional. And what I found was we didn't have a culture. We had about seven cultures. It was because you had different teams, different groups, different departments, very siloed that we're all operating with a different culture. And so I can't make decisions. We can't be strategic. I can't even make opinions about the team until I know what our culture is going to be. So I remember it very fondly. September of 2020, I asked the leadership team to come back into the office at least a day a week Hmm. because we needed to get this culture thing figured out. And I hear people that are able to develop and build a culture remotely. Maybe I'm not that good of a leader. I don't know how you do that. Or at least that's not my style. So they came back in and we really spent a month and a half determining what we wanted our culture to be. We actually did a a leadership team staff retreat for a day in November. So again, this is November, 2020. We were wearing masks, sitting 15 feet apart, in a big old conference room. It was really awkward. Right, right. And we had a facilitator came in and we developed our culture and determined what our core values are going to be. Member focused, collaborative, innovative, and respect. That doesn't really sound unique. And it's not. It's really how you implement that. And so we said, let's define what the behaviors are that reinforce those words. We created the TFI way, which talks about how we go about Scheduling meetings, approaching email, communicating with one another, making phone calls, all those little things that define your culture. A lot of for-profit companies will have safety moments at the beginning of their staff meetings or pre-shift work. We called ours our cultural moments. So at the beginning, even today, of every staff meeting, we take in five minutes and, and we identify what happened in the last week that reflected the culture we want to develop. Oh, I love this. And by the way, people's performance reviews are tied to the culture. I firmly believe what's that old Drucker saying, culture, eat strategy for breakfast, or maybe it's lunch or dinner, I don't know. (laughs) I firmly believe that. And so even our performance management system, staff were evaluated on their ability to align with our culture, not on how many widgets they can make. And what's been the result? Great. I love our culture here. I think, let me step back. The people that didn't like that culture are no longer here. Ah, yes. By choice, though. It was their choice, not me. Right, right. I was very fortunate. I didn't have to terminate anyone. I think one in my transition because we said, look, we as a group have said, this is what we want this organizational culture to be. So either you're aligned with it and you like it or you don't and you leave. And so we did. We had probably five or six people that left including leadership. And, you know, that was the real struggle is that you can't drive that culture through an organization. And I say larger, we're not even really that large at 30 people, but you can't drive that culture throughout the entire organization 
unless the senior team, the senior leaders have completely drunk the Kool-Aid. hundred percent. I mean, they have to be completely bought into it. Absolutely. All in. And if they're not, or if they disagree with it, or they have an alternative culture, they can't stay in a leadership role. Corey, you're doing something interesting with return to the office. What are you doing there? Well, I told you a little bit about coming back in September of 2020. Everybody thought I was crazy. But like I said, our members never left their offices. So we had to push forward. And, you know, I was able to use the new the new card a little bit as well. Two things happened. January 2021, we moved into new office space. And so I think there was an excitement about seeing this new office space. We decided to take three organizations, all in the crop input industry. So you had Crop Life America, which are the crop protection products like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. You had the Ag Retail Association. They sell to the farmers. And then you had the Fertilizer Institute. And so we all have moved into a single suite together. We consolidated some back office staff. So we have common office manager, receptionist, IT, et cetera, that support the entire suite. So there was some excitement about that new space that made people interested in coming back. What we decided then officially to bring everyone back is that we weren't going to require. Oh, so no official mandate, no, no numbers. We never made an official mandate. We learned a couple of things. We best live our culture when we're face-to-face. If your job is to check your email all day long and send on calls, yeah, sure, knock yourself out. That's great. But that's not who we were. That's not the culture we wanted to develop. You can't go from 130 members to 250. We've added 120 members in the last three years. You can't do these acquisitions if you don't have those kind of fundamentals. So we definitely leaned into that. But then we said, we also have heard that flexibility is what everyone loved about that situation. Flexibility to work from home when you've got a Comcast person coming sometime between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Or when you're writing a really deep research report and you need focus time. Exactly. That's one of the examples we used. Or if your kid's sick, or if you want to go to watch their concert. I have three girls. I get it. Or if you have an ailing parent and you want to travel to see them, but work from home a couple of days. I mean, these are all great reasons to work remote. Or you're, we had a person that lives in West Virginia mm. and her round trip commute was three hours every day. These are all great reasons to work remote, but there are also great reasons to be in the office. When you're going to have a strategy session, when you want to do some team development work, when you want to have a staff meeting. And so we laid these out in principles and said, you're all high functioning, high performing adults. You figure out when you need to be in the office. You figure out when you don't need to be in the office. If you're coming into the office to sit on your computer all day long and do email or write a paper or do Zoom calls, do it from home. But if we're having a meeting to work on some strategic plan updates, you better not be calling in for that. You better be here in person. And so we let everybody make that decision. We never put number of days or days of the week they had to be here because every week's different. And frankly, as long as we had the principles there and you had the culture there, we believe we have people that can make those decisions about when to come in and when not to come in. Corey, I'm hearing trust as a recurring theme in this interview. The trust that your members have in you and the organization, the trust that you have in your staff, the trust that the staff have in you. And I think this trust is allowing you to be really flexible and high performing. Amazing. Trust is definitely a big part of it. Respect. Yeah. That's one of our core values is respect. And that's appreciating and understanding that all of those elements we just talked about. Corey, before we go, October 13 is Global Fertilizer Day. So on October 13, 2024, what will you be celebrating? We celebrate the important role that this industry plays in feeding the world and doing it in a sustainable way, contributing to our climate goals, but putting the lunch or dinner that you're going to have with your family on on the plate tonight. We do it through a lot of PR efforts, a lot of social media. We schedule a number of TV, radio interviews. We go on Capitol Hill and offer a reception to our fertilizer caucus. We provide small pumpkins from a local farm that, of course, we're growing with fertilizer because it's October and it's fall and it's harvest and it's Halloween. So those are just little reminders of how we 
cannot survive as a planet. We cannot be sustainable as a planet without fertilizer. Corey, I want to thank you for being on the show today. What an amazing interview. I know I was amazed by some of the things that you shared. I hope that you'll come back in the future and tell us about the conditions that you're operating in and how you're thriving. I would love to. It's been a pleasure. It's always fun to tell our story. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye.